Good afternoon. The Joint Committee on Pensions and Retirement will now come to order. Um, it does not look like we have a quorum at the moment. So if we were to have one shortly, we do. House members and three senators. <laughs> um, so we'll just start with the, our um, presentations and then we will double back and take care of our business if that we are able to take that on. Um, so the first person is Mayor Robert Trainer from the city of Charlestown. If Mr. Trainer would like to go up to the podium. And I believe you have to hit the gray button on the microphone. Okay, we're good to go? Yes, thank you. Madam Chairman, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests and committee, thank you for uh, welcoming us here today. I'm Bob Trainer, as you know, the mayor of Charlestown, West Virginia, and I'm here to talk about the pension program and the shortfallings or the shortcomings that uh, are impacting our police department. Right now I have, um, we're, we have 18 member police department right now down to 14 members. 13 of those members are in uh, total, four are in tier two and the rest are in tier one. And so there's a lot of um, misalignment with the, with the PERS system. We're, uh, as I think uh, probably the, this, this, this uh, committee has, has recognized them municipal police and firefighting pension plan is a much better fit for municipal police departments, right? The reason that we were not able to join that is because we didn't have a qualified uh, pension plan. So we were stuck in, in the PERS uh, system. So, and there's some experts that are gonna come after me and there's a lot to have a lot more of the details than I do. Essentially, um, our folks are paying 10% for the, uh, or rather 4.5 if they're tier one, 6% tier two, and it's an 8.5 percent of the the MPERS. The city is playing 10 percent right now for tier or for all the peer the PERS and 8.5 for the MPERS, and it would be 8.5 for MPERS. So I just made some quick calculations. If you took from 2015 when that window I think was open to today, the difference would be basically our our the, the individuals in the in the PERS system would be short 290 thousand. I'm not didn't didn't do any actuaries or anything like that but the city would be up 112,000 based on what we were contributed to both programs. So it'd be a Delta of about 188,000. Kind of what we're looking for from this committee is some relief for our police department. I, right now I'm, I'm, I'm down four people. I can't keep people. I've lost 100% of my tier two people over the past 12 months. They come in, they take a look around, see there's a better program. We pay about between six and $10,000 to get them qualified. They look around, they see our retirement system. There's a better retirement system of the sheriff's department, the state police, and they move on to, a, to the another agency. So I'm just kind of looking for some type of release. I think the municipal police and firefighting, firefighters pension plan would probably be the easiest answer, but I know there's been some other ideas floated out there just as long as the, 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 the uh, parameters of the emperors are met in what other, other, what, what other whatever other retirement system that you come up with, I think it'd be good. I apologize that I'm not speaking very clearly here, but uh, there's a lot of folks here. So I will be more than happy to take questions, but I figure that's at the end of this session, right? Yes, thank you. We'll do questions. Well, it may be easier to just do questions individually. So does anyone have any questions for Mayor Trainer from the committee? What's a nice guy like me doing a place like this? <laughs> Okay, the Senator from the second. Just for clarification, I, I may have missed what you said. You say you are not participating in any retirement system with the state at this time? No, we are. We are in PERS. I have folks in PERS one and PERS two. One and two. Okay, yes, that's, sir. that's what I'm, thank you. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And next up, we have Councilman Kevin Tester, also with the city of Charlestown. Uh, Madam Chair, Chair, 
uh, select members of the select committee and uh, distinguished guests in the room. Thank you for allowing us this time. My name is Kevin Tester. I'm in the Ward 2 City Council member in the city of Charlestown. And I've come up here with our mayor, Mr. Trainer, and several representatives of law enforcement in different agencies across the state who are affected by this very pension issue. I'm gonna let them speak to their direct uh, input as to how this has negatively affected them. But what I really do wanna say, and I'll keep this very brief, is for the city of Charleston in particular, if we do not stop the bleeding of not being able to backfill these open positions, we're currently down four, we've approved one from the council to add a, an additional, so that gets us down five officers. At this current rate with officers leaving once they come on after we've invested time and money to get them onboarded because they're finding better retirement in other parts of the state and in other states, what will eventually happen was we will have to disband our own police agency, as well as some of these other agencies across the state that are negatively affected. When this happens, and I'm sure that there's going to be lots of conversations in the future about cost, this will come back to you in one way or the other, because if agencies like the Charlestown Police Force and these other agencies that are here today no longer exist, it has to be backfilled from some other agency be it a county agency or the state troopers, someone has to police these municipalities. We'd much rather see it done on the local level where we have a great community policing effort, where our police and our community work well together to solve issues. Either way, it's going to cost our state money, one way or the other. So either we deal with this and keep good police officers on the street in these municipal agencies, or it eventually will roll back up to you guys. So I, I, I strongly ask that you at least consider resolution in some way to get these agencies so they can get in the correct retirement plan to be able to work a reasonable amount of time and retire and not be working till they're 60 and plus. Because I don't know about you, my son's a police officer. I really don't want to see him on the streets at 60 running down criminals. So I just ask that you strongly look at this in the next coming weeks and months and see if we can find a resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have a question or any questions for Councilman Tester? Get off easy today, sir. Thank you. The next we have on our agenda is Chief Chris Kutcher from the Charlestown Police Department. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time uh, today. I really appreciate it. I'm a 22 year veteran of the Charlestown Police Department. I've been the chief for 12 years. Uh, I've seen we're a civil service agency uh, and it's been a challenge for us and trying to maintain a workforce that uh, provides a high level. Uh, we just went through the CLIA national accreditation, uh, which we're the third in the state of West Virginia to, to receive that honor. Um, that's adopting the best practices in law enforcement, uh, Parkersburg, Buchanan, and Charlestown are the, the, the three agencies that have gone through that. I put a lot of pride and hard work into to my department to, to provide the best service we can to our community there in Charlestown. We are the county seat. We have over 40,000 people that come through there on a daily basis. Uh, you know, and it's, it's been a challenge. We've lost three uh, over the past year. And that's when we did our exit interviews, they went on to better departments because of the retirement. We're competitive in the salary side of things and the other benefits that we offer. Um, we lost one to the cadet class. We lost one uh, to surrounding areas. We're sandwiched in between Northern Virginia, uh, uh, Maryland, uh, that all have better systems. You know, the deputy sheriff stuff. Uh, when we ended up, we go through our hiring phase. We uh, essentially, people get to pick. Uh, that's the narrative in our country at this point. Uh, the, they, we lose candidates to the deputy sheriffs. Uh, so essentially what I, I've been working on this project for over three years now uh, and trying to get some relief. Uh, I look at the tier one and the tier two per system and I compare it to from the troopers all the way down to the municipal police and firemen. All we're asking for is an opportunity to be on a level playing field with those. When we, we look at the, the required age service, uh, whether it's 50 at 70, 55 at 80, or a flat 25 years of service. Uh, the multiplier, whether it's 2% up to 3%. Uh, we wanna look at disability, death benefit. Uh, we're not competing in those. And essentially, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's detrimental to us. And again, I, I don't want to think about not having a police department because I've given my life to that. Uh, but we're asking for any help, any consideration uh, from you all to help us uh, achieve that goal. Any questions? Thank you. Does, does anyone have any questions for the chief? Senator? Guess you're getting off. <laughs> Next up, we have Chief Lance Morrison with Ravenswood Police Department. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a great honor to be here. And uh, I really appreciate that. My name is Lance Morrison. I'm the chief of the Ravenswood Police Department, where I've served for 12 years. I've been in law enforcement 18 years and served uh, in our nation's Air Force for four years as an MP. We came here today uh, to discuss our retirement issues with you and hopefully impress upon you the importance of what this means to us in our state and our law enforcement. I personally made this trip today out of desperation to save a law enforcement agency in our community. You know, as administrators, we have a lot of goals for our agencies. We employ, we try to employ officers who bring integrity, honesty, and morality to our profession. That's important today. We try to train officers to handle every sick and twisted incident that you can possibly imagine and to be able to do so while surviving each and every day in law enforcement. We try to retain a police officer that adequately serves and protects the citizens of his jurisdiction. And it's in my opinion that the government shares a role in this as well. You see, I believe from the president on down to the mayor, the number one duty of any government official is the protection of the citizens that it serves. But as the protectors and the, speaking on a standpoint of those who do the protecting, we can't do so without employees. And that brings us to recruitment and retention. You know, there's a recruitment problem across the country in every career field. It seems like nobody can find anywhere to, anybody to work. You go to a restaurant, there's no employees, they close, what, et cetera, et cetera. But in law enforcement, as you probably all know, this is especially the case. When I tested uh, back when I was in the state police, I had, um, there was 800, 1,000 of us tested. Uh, when I first became chief here, I would get anywhere from 30 to 40. Now we get five, right? And now there's five, three of them don't pass the PT test. One fails the background, and maybe the second one doesn't make it for other reasons. You see, now we're tending to hire out of desperation. And in time when law enforcement's under such scrutiny, that's a dangerous endeavor. In the way of retention, you know, retention really starts because recruitment and retention are two, two different things. Young officers really don't look at retirement when they hire, right? They, a lot, of, a lot of times you hear out a new policeman, you hear these words, well, I would pay to do this job. I can't believe they're paying me to do it, right? They love the job, it's a calling. But when they hit that five to seven year mark, the things they've been through and the thing they, they have seen in the line of duty cause them to pause and ask questions like, how many shootouts can I survive? And by the way, usually when a policeman starts, he's single. And you don't really care about your life at that point because you're just kind of reckless. And when you have children and you get married, you start to care, right? So the number of shootouts that you've been in, I was in a shootout within my seven year mark. The number of needles we have to handle, the amount of fentanyl we have to endure, the amount of fights that we have to endure. How much blood does an officer have to step through in his career to be enough? How many children, adults, and others do we have to watch carved open in autopsies in our career? How much death can a policeman take? How many divorces can he endure? For me, at the seven-year mark, I responded to a hostage suicide call. A man was holding his mother hostage with a, with a pistol. And at one point, I convinced the deputy they were exchanging the phone out of the window of the house with a suicide hotline and I convinced the deputy to pull him out of the window. Well, as the deputy grabs him to pull him out the window, the guy gets stuck and he's got one hand free in the house. And my thought was he's gonna kill the deputy. So I ran and kicked in the front of the door of the house and went in and me and another deputy went in and arrested the guy. After the incident was over, 
I felt something in my lower back and it turns out that I'd herniated a disc. 12 years later, I stand before you today, have it had three surgeries and a spinal fusion. And if this meeting would have occurred last year, I couldn't have stood here. I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand, my wife had to dress me and I'm 43. There's no way I could do this until I was 62 years old. And as it is, I have concerns over my age now. So when an officer gets to that point, he starts looking towards the future and he starts realizing, I can't do this until I'm 62 years old. Now I'm talking about tier two at this point. I've got two officers that I'm looking at hiring right now. They're 19 years old. By the way, one of them just got his driver's license two months ago. When he realizes he has to work 43 years in law enforcement, we're going to lose him. And he would have to be simple to stay. That's the problem we face. We are losing our policemen and we have no one to backfill. But you know, let me talk about tier one real quick. So I have an officer that works for me at 32 years of service, looked to retire. His hips began hurting, his knees, his back. So he petitioned the board to see what his retirement would be. Now, the problem with the tier one is he hadn't reached his 55 year, his age of 55 yet. Years and age of service equal age, and you have to be 55. He was 52. At 32 years of service with the reduced amount, he was drawing $800 a month with no insurance. And I ask you, who can live on that? Who can live on that? So he had to stay another three years. He retires in March, and he will draw $2,100 a month minus $600 a month in insurance. Now, conversely, if he was in Emphers, his multipliers would have been much higher. He could have retired at the age of 50 and had a much, much better life for the service that he gave to his community. So my question is this, who would be willing to work for us for that length of period? Would you? Because I wouldn't, right? I think we need to focus on taking care of the people that, that take care of us. The last question I have is why the discrepancy? You know, within my agency, just my agency alone, 10 people were in tier one and tier two. Now I'm going to call them different retirements. They're in the same retirement system. But when you look at how long they have to work, they're two different retirement systems. Neither one of them are good, but you already have a solution and that's inverse, right? What I would ask of you today is not to just look at us and take us for granted. And I don't think you will. I want you to take this to heart. Take to heart what these guys go through every day and what we go through. You're going to hear from a guy that's been shot in the line of duty. This is serious. And our communities deserve to have a police department because I shudder to think when I have to cancel my midnight shifts or cancel other, other things that we, we serve in our community. With that, you have my respect. And I ask you to strongly consider moving tier one and tier two into Embers. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Chief Morrison? I have a couple. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you know how many members are within your department? 10. And how many of those are tier one? Probably four of us. And how many are tier two? Six. I'm giving you rough, I, I, that's my best guess. Okay. Okay, thank now, you. Can I add one thing to that? Sure. So I know there's some thoughts about when someone retires, like, so if you move tier one people into infers, right, there's the thought of, they haven't contributed anything into that system, right? That's an obvious thought. So as soon as they move, they're going to qualify to retire. One thing you can consider is saying, okay, we're, we're going to move you, but you have to work three years, just given a number, three years, and you have to contribute to that system before you can retire, right? Because I understand the thought process of, well, this guy's been in this tier one system X amount of years. As soon as we move him over, he's eligible to retire, bang, and he's never contributed to the system. That's a problem. But I believe every problem has a solution. Thank you. Very right, thank you. Um, next up, we have Chief Brad Anderson with the Ripley Police Department. Hello, and thank you for having us today. Uh, I'm. Uh, 
it's hard to follow that speech there. <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to talk about some, some personal things that's happened with my department. I, I have a uh, 11 man department, and uh, we're also on the peers uh, or the, the one and two. Uh, problem I have is uh, I at least every year I'm I'm having to hire one to two officers almost every year. It's almost as if other departments who are who have the better retirement basically just watch me hire guys and wait till I put, spend the five thousand six thousand dollars for the academy. And once they get out of the academy, they go they they come to them. Hey, we can give you a lot better benefits if you do this. Uh, if you come to us, your retirement will be a lot better. I have a 19 year old that I just hired six months ago. Uh, the other day he came to me, it just, he didn't think of it when I hired him. Cause when you're that young, you just want, you're gung ho. You just want to be that police officer. Well, when he figured out what his retirement was, it shocked him. It shocked him that he's going to have to spend 40 some years. Now, 40 years as a police officer used to be a huge achievement. If you retired with 40 years as a police officer, that's a huge thing. If we don't fix this system, that's going to become the norm. And, uh, and, and that's just not good. I mean, police officers go through such a wear and tear. When they're, I've, I've been through surgeries upon surgeries, legs, hips, knees, all that stuff. I couldn't imagine that if I was at my age now, is I would still have about 16 or 17 more years to go from here. And that's a, that's a pretty long way. And my body's endured quite a bit of stress and, my mind has endured so many things in this, in the 22 years that I've been a police officer. So, uh, you know, we have a local sheriff's department. It's, I'm in the same county as Lance here. Uh, you know, the local sheriff's department, we're basically farming the sheriff's department. They're just, we're just bringing our officers in. And every couple of years when they need a new one, we just shift them from us to them. You know, they get their signing bonuses with them. They get the better retirement to the deputy sheriff's retirement. So it's a huge retention thing for me. If I had a better retirement, I believe I'd be, I can, when it comes to salary and when it comes to health insurance, we compete with the other departments, but when it comes to retirement, we are way off, just way off. So I just ask that we look into some way of either fixing what we're at or letting us move into the uh, other retirement to where these guys can actually do their job and not have to worry about later that down the road in life. And that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Do any of the committee have questions for Chief Anderson? Well, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what the starting salary? I should have asked this of the others, and I'll go back to you if that's. But your starting salary and then salary ranges. Our starting for your salary. A starting officer in my department will make uh, approximately about thirty-four to thirty-five thousand a year. I think it comes down to uh, fifteen dollars an hour when they're out of the academy. And then you mentioned you have, uh, uh, I guess, a department of eleven. Is that right? Yes, eleven. So what, what kind of, what range of salary oh, do you offer? It's uh, the low of 34 coming in. What's the, what's the high end? The, the high end would probably be, uh, I think our, and don't quote me exact price. Uh, no, no, uh, we're just looking for uh, my, my captain's probably making, and that would be our highest rank uh, is he's probably making, I want to say $22 an hour. It, it's not a huge so everybody's an hourly and not a fixed salary? Yes, it's hourly, yes. Okay, all right. And there's over overtime then? Yes, there is overtime. Okay. Uh, quickly, maybe we can come back to the, the other two, if that's okay, if that's all right, Madam Chair. Same question? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this with overtime, okay? Roughly a new guy starting out with us with overtime is around 40000 okay. Uh We've had to uh, get creative with things. We've, I've created what our um, incentive pay program. Uh, so in other words, if a guy wants to be a firearms instructor, I've allowed a position for that in the department, and that's a 500 or or $1,000 increase. In addition, uh, we're pretty lucky with our agencies in the way of health insurance. Uh, Ripley and I both offer 100% free health insurance. And we've had to get creative, and we've had to ask a lot of our councils um, to retain our officers. And unfortunately, uh, Chief Anderson was mentioned in our sheriff's office, um, without, without our two agencies in the county, our sheriff's office wouldn't have any applicants. 
uh, you know, so the, they survived because of us. Uh, we were barely surviving. And it, if it wasn't for us, um, they wouldn't have any applicants either. And they're getting those primarily because of the deputy sheriff's retirement, which is almost e equivalent to the municipal police and fire retirement. Okay, and then, um, thank you, Chief. Chief. <laughs> With Charlestown, we have uh, 14 members. So we have 10 in the tier one, and then we have the four in the tier two at this point. Our starting salary uh, is just, just over 48,000. Uh, and we do a tier uh, program as far as once they get their certified rate, we bump them another step. So it's just over uh, 49,000, it's about two and a half percent difference. Uh, our starting could be, or I'm sorry, the, the highest rank is our captain. Uh, he's getting ready to retire, so I didn't include him. Actually, it's 13. I got to take him out of there because uh, he's going to retire in April. Uh, his max salary after 26 years of service is uh, close to 90. Well, thank you for the information. And again, uh, do thank all of you all and your members for the service that you're providing. So. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. The lady from the 38th has a question for whom? For the last gentleman. So you, I'm sorry for my voice. But, um, thank you, all of you, for being here. Um, all of you have mentioned so far that your salaries are competitive. So it's not a salary issue is the, the supposition. It is a retirement issue for retention purposes. So my question is, you know, if, if the deputy sheriff uh, is more competitive than you with the retirement, then it, I mean, I would think it would just stand to reason that you need to be more than just competitive in the other avenues that are open to you like salary. So uh, uh, why has that route not been taken? Well, I, I believe we have when, uh, like uh, Chief Morrison said, we paid the entire house insurance for the entire family. That's one of the things we did. Your, your whole family gets their insurance paid. So that, that's one step that we made to help out where the sheriff's department doesn't get that. Mm -hmm. But it's still, uh, and when I say competitive salaries, we're competitive in Jackson County. The surrounding counties were far off from that. So, uh, you know, I also, uh, I have lost officers to other counties. It seems like I lose more to our local sheriff's department because they don't want to leave home. But uh, it's, you know, when it comes to competitive wise, we've tried everything we can. I've, I've actually got, and the $15 an hour was a raise that we just got to maybe two years ago, maybe less than that. So I've tried, I've only been chief for four years now, but we've tried to eventually do whatever I can. He's come up with different ideas to pay his officers uh, for certain certifications they have we it's uh, we do everything we can it's just uh, that's that's really a big key because i mean a police officer working into their 60s is, is pretty rough unless you you're an administrative administrative uh, part of the police work and that would in my department the only administrative was really just me so i assume that um you know, you, you know, automatically when you bring in, bring on a new hire that you're going to have that $10,000 cost for the academy training. Yes, it's close to that. Yeah. So my question would be, um, why don't you have like an immediate $10,000 bump up in salary for your current people? Because that might prevent them from being poached by, and then you're going to, it's a sunk cost anyway. Right, at cost you're, you're going to have to plan on paying if you have to replace them. So why not try to get ahead of it and just bump by 10 grand? Because if they want to stay at home, I would think that would be a heck of an incentive. I, th I think so too. That's a great idea. I think that would, uh, and we've tried some things like uh, off bonuses. I believe, I think you guys have given bonuses in the last year. Um, I don't want to speak for him, but uh, we've, we've done some bonuses and stuff, retention bonuses to keep guys. Again, it comes to the fact is where is my body going to be? Where is my mental status going to be by the time when we see all the things we see, do all the things we do? Retirement is a huge part, but not so much until you're about your fifth or sixth year. At first, when you come in, you don't think about any of that. I never thought about that. Honestly, I never thought about retirement until about the last five or six years ago. But now it's, I mean, it's becoming a big and bigger yeah, thing. I, now. I, I do think that that is your strongest argument, the fact that the age requirements probably something that 
that does have to be addressed. I was just curious if you had thought about that ten thousand dollars. It's a it's a cost you're going to end up paying one Absolutely. way or the other. I, I try. If I have an officer that tries to leave my department, I try to do things like that to get him to stay. It just it just doesn't work, and I don't know why it doesn't. You think it would, but uh, it it just doesn't work that way sometimes. People want to live long, healthy lives. Yeah. <laughs> I could add to that. We at Charlestown, we did add sign on bonuses. Uh, again, we're sandwiched between Berkeley County and the state police. It's upwards of 55 to start. And then we've got Loudoun County that is 65, 70,000. So we're kind of smashed in that sandwich and we're all competing for the small pool of, of people. We've, we've done uh, certified up to $10,000, no takers. We advertise here in the central part of the state and down south, northern Pan Am. We, we send it out to every agency. Charlestown, the cost of living in Charlestown is a lot higher than it is in other areas. We've, we've done uh, laterals for other agencies, uh, you know, from D.C. to northern, maybe when they get out of the hustle and the bustle of the big city, we've done 5,000. We've done 2,500 uh, for just average Joe to come in the door. We got seven in our last testing cycle. We had one person pass the test. He took a job that had a better retirement system and paid a couple thousand dollars more than we did. So as far as the salaries being competitive, that's subjective to where we live, right? So I'm not trying to compare my salary I wish I could to his, right? that'd be great. I would have no problems, but no matter, depending on where you live in the state depends roughly on what the salary is going to be. Now, as I stated, we're losing our guys mostly to the local sheriff's office, right? The, the, the dynamic that's different between us and the sheriff's office is health insurance. That's the big deal for them. They're paying $600 a month in health insurance, right? Where our guys have it free. But the problem is they don't want to work that long. They want to have some quality of life when they retire. They don't want to get killed in the line of duty, right? Um, and their multipliers are higher. So they'll also work less and draw more. So the health insurance thing because it becomes a non-issue, especially when their spouse has a job. So that's where we're at. Do we have a representative here from the Chief of Police's Association? Would you go up to, and introduce yourself? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Johnson. I am a chief. I'm the chief at uh, Yeager Airport CRW at Charleston, West Virginia, but I'm here before you today representing the West Virginia Chiefs of Police Association. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to hear our concerns. Uh, those that have come before me have made the majority of the valid points, so there's just a few things I want to add here. Uh, I've been a uh, elected board member on the Chiefs of Police Association for nine years now. This is always a topic at our conferences. Uh, we just had a conference the end of September, 1st October. This topic has come up again, and the problem is going to continue to exist unless some changes can be made. And we're going to continue requesting these meetings until some changes can be made. Because as they said, they're becoming farming agencies for other departments. Uh, you talk about recruitment, that can be difficult enough and bonuses can help with that. But when it comes to retention issues under tier one and tier two, that's where the problem exists. The Chiefs of Police Association is, uh, we keep between 115 and 130 members uh, annually and it's chiefs and upper echelon law enforcement from around the state. And everyone agrees that these issues need to be addressed and something needs to change for these smaller departments that are giving up these officers. One thing I did wanna mention that hasn't come up yet is, is because my department's a little unique, um, West Virginia State Capitol Police, I've talked with Chief Foreman on a, on a regular basis, and there are other departments around the state that have typically been retirement departments. It's that way for me, I retired from Charleston PD under their pension, I'm now under tier two at Yeager Airport. Chief Foreman retired from the state police. He's now under PERS tier one or two at the state capitol. Because those departments have typically always been retirement departments, those officers are being hired under tier one and tier two. 
but they're already collecting a retirement from their previous department. The chief of Wheeling, same thing. The chief of South Charleston, same thing. What I see as an issue is, is if we can move all the tier one, tier two agencies over to MPFRS, then I'm trying to look long-term for the departments that are affected 15 years down the road when these departments that transition to MPFRS in 2010 begin retiring, your state capital is not going to have retirees. Your airport's not going to have retirees coming up there to work. So the question continually comes up with the Chiefs of Police Association, why is it that under the CPRB, a department can't hire under two different pension systems that fall under the Public Retirement Board? So I ask you to keep that in mind as you uh, take all of these other, other considerations. Um, with that, I think they've covered the majority of everything else. So again, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for your attention and consideration. Are there any questions for the chief? Do we have a member of the West Virginia Fraternal Order of Police? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Can we get Mr. Fleck with the Consolidated Public Retirement Board up to the mic? When you introduce yourself, just so that everyone is aware. Thank you. I'm Jeff Fleck, Executive Director of the Consolidated Public Retirement Board. Thank you for having me here today. So I don't necessarily have any questions. Um, it's a lot of information. We've been taking it in over the last over the last couple of months in different discussions, but not in this formal setting. Um, could you give any back information or any information from your perspective as to the, the, the changes in the plans and some of the creation of the new plans and any other information that would resonate with the committee? Yeah, well, you've heard a lot of information today and uh, from these uh, gentlemen. And uh, so this is an issue, but it's not a new issue. It's an issue that's been around for quite a while. And in uh, 2016, the legislature did open a window uh, for municipalities to transfer um, uh, from tier one to tier two in per, well, actually just tier two in PERS at that time. Um, into the municipal police and fire plan. And um, there are over 50 municipalities that have employees in PERS. Of those over 50 employers, only three chose to uh, take advantage of that window at that time. Uh, those three were Buchanan, Bridgeport, and Hurricane. Uh, but as far as I know, most of the other 50 um, did qualify at that time. And it is a situation where um, they have to elect to, to do it because it is a higher cost to uh, the city and it is a higher cost to the employees. But as I mentioned, when that window was opened in 2016, they gave them until July of 2017 uh, to, to elect to participate. And it was just for their tier two employees, anyone hired after July 1st, 2015. Uh, and uh, there are over, as I mentioned, over 50 municipalities that would qualify or that did qualify at that time and would qualify again if the legislature saw fit to open another window. Um, and over 300 employees with those 50 employers um, that would qualify. Uh, but as happened in 2016, you know, only three elected to uh, take advantage of that. And if another window was opened, I'm sure not all 50 would elect to uh, take advantage of that as well. But that, that's some background on it. Thank you. Um, does the gentleman from the 27th, the delegate. From the uh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. You mentioned that there are or over 50, we have three represented today that obviously have interest. Mm -hmm. Have you had other municipalities press upon you the interest of that um, 50? We have had a few. Um, uh, Lewisburg is one of those. Um, 
but uh, I would say um, the representatives we have here today have been the primary ones who have expressed interest in opening up, up a window. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the lady from the 38th. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> Do we have any empirical data on the rate of new hire for the three municipalities that chose to transfer before the transfer, after the transfer, like any of that? And no. especially, especially the rate of um, um, new hire today. Okay. No, I don't have that. I do know that when the window was open, there were just a handful of people that transferred because it was just for tier two people. And at that time, tier two had only been around for two years. Um, so there, of those three municipalities, there were very few employees that qualified. But when they chose to, uh, when they elected to participate, any new hires would go into the municipal police and fire plan. But I can find out of those three employers how many they've had since then uh, that have gone into the municipal police and fire plan. I can get back with you on that. That might be helpful just to know if this is actually going to address the problem. Yeah. Great. Any other questions for Mr. Fleck? Co-chair? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jeff, for the drive up here. And um, So looking back at the bill that uh, was introduced, I guess, or passed in 16, what other qualifications were inherent in that legislation? Well, it was uh, in code, uh, the section is 822A33. And um, it says that uh, any municipality or municipal subdivision that employs individuals as members of paid police departments or paid fire departments, but did not establish either a municipal policeman's pension and relief fund or a municipal fireman's pension and relief fund, um, are, uh, and are participating in the public employees retirement uh, system may elect in the same manner to become a participating public employer in the municipal police and fire plan. So that phrase is what prohibited the city of Charlestown from participating because they did previously have uh, their own municipal police and fire plan. And there's nothing in anything in the future that would prohibit or uh, allow the elimination of that particular language so that no if we uh, were to reintroduce the same bill if the legislature okay, saw that's all. fit yeah uh you mentioned uh that um these three had to go up for a vote and they had a one-year time frame yeah it was the municipality at that time had to make its election on or prior to july 1st 2017 um and did both the employer and the employees have to have separate votes or was it a single vote or um, um, how, let's see. who controls that? Uh, it says the municipality or municipal subdivision may elect to include only police officers and firefighters who've been hired on or after July 1st, 2015. Police officers and firefighters hired before July 1st, 2015 will remain in, in PER. So according to the statute, only the municipality voted, not the employees. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Fleck, I just have a question. You said that the departments that are here are the ones that you have heard the most from. Have you heard it from any fire departments of their concern? No, no, not really. And I don't think there's many firefighters um, uh, in this. Uh, of the 50 employers that I'm looking at, I would say probably 80% it says no fire. Okay. Uh, so there are much fewer firefighters that would be, uh, that would qualify for this. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from the place. Uh, just follow up a little bit because I obviously don't have any historical perspective concerning the Charlestown previous pension, but what happened to that municipal pension? Was it rolled into PERS? Is it dissolved? Did it I'm not sure. And I know Blair Taylor is going to be speaking and he may have some of that historical information. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. The lady from 38. Just to clarify for the usefulness of the data, hopefully you can get for us. I'm only interested in replacement hire, not if they expanded the department or any other type of new hire, but I'm looking for, like, if we can get it, 
um, the numbers of like they lost someone and had to replace okay. because otherwise they, it'll it'll skew the data. And we will have to get that information directly from the uh, employer because when they report to us as a municipality, they have various employees, sure. um, and it's not indicated to us whether they're police, fire, secretaries, um, mm -hmm. city workers. Um, uh, so we would have to contact each employer individually and ask them uh, how many uh, police they have uh, and if they could tell us how many police they had back in 2017. Yeah, hopefully they'll be able to get that data. Yeah. And it hope, luckily it's only three, but it might give yeah. some insight. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Blair Taylor with the Municipal Pension Oversight Board. Good afternoon. My name is Blair Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Municipal Pension Oversight Board. I came up here today or was asked to come up here today to talk uh, specifically about Charlestown. So I will do that and that'll answer uh, Delegate Gearhart's question uh, to an extent. I believe it was 1997 prior to the Oversight Board even existing. The Oversight Board was created in 2009. I was hired in Actually, I started in July, in January of 11. So, uh, but but I do have history because I worked in the treasurer's office before that, and that's where some of the state monies were dispersed from the state treasurer's office to municipal police and fire pensions. Charlestown closed their pension to new hires back in the 90s, uh, and they actually closed their system permanently in 1997. There was no code authority for them to make that change. They just, at that time, the city council elected to start putting new hires into PERS. And at the time, obviously it was PERS one. Um, there, when that occurred and when the oversight board was created back in, in nine, I started working in 11. Like I said, at that time it had been closed for uh, gosh, almost 15 years. And so there were, uh, the city was in a position where every new hire that they hired went into PERS 1. Um, I've worked with Senator Rucker uh, several times over the course of uh, the last number of years trying to figure out how do we get um, Charlestown town to have the ability to put in uh, to the Emperor's plan or once Emperor's was started. But Emperor's, remember, Emperor's was created back in 2009 when the oversight board was created to allow municipalities with municipal police pension plans, municipal fire pension plans to close those pension plans and put their new hires into a new statewide system. And that system uh, is the municipal police officers and firefighters retirement system. So without the municipal systems being able or municipalities being able to close their existing municipal systems, you wouldn't have an MPERS. That's kind of the beginnings of Empers, and I'm not trying to step on Mr. Fleck's uh, 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 purview because that's certainly his his uh, his work. But that's why we have an Empers plan. Um, in 2016, when the legislation was being created to allow or the window to create the window, I said to uh, uh, anybody that would listen to me at the time, "Hey, we're excluding Charlestown here." Uh, we're excluding Charlestown here, but it, I guess I didn't have a loud enough voice because Charlestown did have that municipal police pension plan that was that was closed, albeit it, there was no authority to do it, but it was closed. So they've got a police pension plan. There's still four members in that plan. There's one retiree and three uh, survivors, and that plan will exist until there are no more beneficiaries. That could be another 30 probably not now, it's probably another 20 years, give or take, um, until that last person has, has died, that plan will exist. There's just no active members paying into that plan. The city pays in the plan, and there's a little bit of state money that goes in that plan every year. But that plan will exist and uh, for the benefit of those members or that member and the retirees. Uh, so that will continue to, to be there. Um, I certainly can't speak to any of the issues that that the that the other departments have have talked about, and so I, I don't want to step. You know, I, I, that's not my it's not my purview. The Oversight Board works with the 53 police and fire pension plans. There are 31 
cities in the state with police pension plans. And there's 22 of those cities also have fire pension plans. There was a question about though how many of the other cities have fire. As, as, as Mr. Fluck indicated, very few, if any, because those that have paid fire departments had a fire pension plan. Uh, and like I said, those are, there were 22 cities across the state that did, and, and none of, there are several of those fire pension plans that have been closed since uh, 2009, but uh, all of them still have active members that are paying in at this point. Thank you. Judge 27th. And just to, to, so I understand summarized here, but did you tell me this, Charlestown is truly an anomaly here. Yes, sir. By the act of a city council that they didn't have authority to, to take from 25 years ago. Yes, sir, that's correct. Charlestown is an anomaly. We have no other police or fire pension. We have no other municipality that has a police or fire pension plan that closed their police or fire yeah, pension and, plan. And which they without, didn't have authority to do. Exactly, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Co-Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, I probably should have asked this of Mr. Fleck, but um, we've talked about PERS one and two, and obviously there's uh, an employer and employee contribution percentage. And we've talked about MFERS, which also has an employer and employee contribution that are different than PERS. Uh, should a move occur, and let's just, it's 10% on PERS for employer, eight and a half on MFERS. Um, and then let's just, the employee for PERS um, ranges between four and a half if you're in one and 6% if you're in two with an eight and a half for the employee. If a move were to occur, what happens about the difference over time? Sir, that's not my, Okay. none of those are my <laughs> retirement systems <laughs> and, and I defer. <laughs> uh, I can uh, get is in this trouble. a Ken question? <laughs> yes. Okay, all right, may, all right, thank you. If, if we may have Ken at the right time. Uh, yep, okay. exactly. Blair, wise job to dodge that bullet. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Any directed questions for Mr. Taylor? that Mr. Taylor would be able to answer. Thank you, sir. And now there's been a request for Mr. Woodson to approach the microphone. If you would please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ken Woodson. I'm the Consolidated Public Retirement Board Actuary. Coach. Again, not looking for any gross numbers or whatnot, but to the extent that there is a difference in contribution amounts, uh, what happens to those that are in current service and how that is either made up or not and who makes that up? So you're referring to people that would potentially transfer over from, from PERS, PERS to MFERS? If, if it were to MFERS, yes. There's various ways you can do that. Um, one way would be to make the plan whole from a employee contribution, not totally whole, but just from a pure employee contribution perspective. So if you brought somebody over, for example, from PERS tier one, they were contributing four and a half percent of their pay. And all of that service that came over, had they always been in inference, would have been at eight and a half percent to pay. So you could ask for a makeup contribution uh, with or without interest. There's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, but that would not make the plant emperors whole because the benefits with emperors are much more valuable as people are aware compared to PERS. And so, you know, there is additional perhaps uh, contributions that would have to be made to make up, make the plan totally whole. And then to the extent that the employer contribution drops, yeah. I, what happens to that, uh, in essence, overpayment? Well, I should make a comment on that. Uh, currently, right now, uh, for fiscal 2023, PERS employers are contributing 9% of pay. It has dropped from 10 to 9. And right now, uh, the employer contribution in uh, MFERS is 8.5. But I think it's pretty important to recognize that the current population of MFERS is very young with low service. So their liabilities are very low right now. 
And that's enabling, uh, you know, to have an eight and a half percent employer multiplier, uh, employer uh, uh, contribution rate. However, if we bring in tier one and tier two into infers, that's going to be an older population than the current existing infers population, and they would be more expensive. Uh, I don't have any numbers today, uh, but it's certainly plausible that if you brought in all of tier one and tier two from PERS into MFERS, um, roughly 300 and some odd uh, members, um, you know, that's about 50, almost 50% 50 of the current active population you have in MFERS right now. And that would be a much more expensive group. So we'd have to look at the numbers and see what would that do to the emperor's employer contribution rate, assuming that the member stayed at eight and a half? Okay. It's good for me, but thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Woods? Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. If you could just in, announce yourself, just for anyone that may be listening. Uh, Bob Trainer, the mayor of Charlestown. I really appreciate all the, the brain trust back here. I just want to point out that when our pension plan was ended, unofficial or un, uh, illegally, maybe, nobody at city council right now or the mayor or anybody on the police department was there when that happened. So I just wanted to remind everybody that's really the folks that are suffering, the consequences of those decisions, they're long gone. The folks here are, they had nothing to do with those decisions. And again, I appreciate all the information. I'm, I've learned an awful lot, an awful lot by being here. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other business to come before the committee? If not, um, there's a motion before for adjournment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Stay. Thank you. We're adjourned. Any opposed? Stay. <laughs>